This is Amy Laura Hall, and I'm going to be reading through more sections of my book, Laughing at the Devil, Seeing the World with Julian of Norwich. The book was published by Duke University Press, and it has a beautiful cover with which I start each installment. So this is the third installment of my reading my own book, and this is my fourth book. You can look up my other titles in other places, but this is my fourth book called Laughing at the Devil, and I'll be reading the acknowledgments, and then I will also try to get all the way through, if I can, the introduction to the book in this session. So first, the acknowledgments. Miriam Angris has edited a book that crosses boundaries. I am grateful for her courage. I am grateful to Judith Hoover and Liz Smith for correcting and clarifying my prose. Elizabeth Spearing translated Julian of Norwich from Julian's English to my own. I am grateful for her expertise. Shannon Gake told me reading Julian is important Professor Gake also recommended more readings about vernacular theology. Elizabeth Spearing and Shannon Gake prompted me to ask librarians at Duke University for more essays about this period. I am grateful to every librarian at Duke who made this book possible. Elizabeth Benson, Judith Hayhoe and David Lott read the manuscript and helped me to write in the vernacular. Maria Pykova Tivnin taught me the difference. Liturgy does not respect boundaries of past and present. David Lott read the manuscript and helped me convey the present and past of liturgy. Students at Duke Divinity School, University of Virginia, Point Loma, and Princeton Seminary helped me discern how best to teach Julian. Robert C. Lyons wrote a close reading of Julian in 2000 that helped me decide to teach her works as long as I have words to speak. Silas Barber and Amanda Smith listened as I sorted out what most matters. Lillian Daniel and J. Cameron Carter reminded me to preach. Rachel and Emily inspire every word I write. I now dedicate this book to my parents. This is long overdue. Dear Carol Tisdale Hall and Robert Edward Hall, I love you. <laughs> you were my mom and dad. You are now Cookie and Pop to Emily, Rachel, and my beloved nephews. You taught me to read words closely, to love real people, to be brave, to sing hymns even when I do not have the spirit in me, and always to risk the truth. And now I'm going to pause and come back to the introduction of my book. So now the introduction to my book. Introduction, love in everything. This is a quote that I begin with from Julian of Norwich herself translated by Elizabeth Spearing from the Middle English. Though the three persons of the Trinity are all equal in themselves, my soul understood love most clearly, yes. And God wants us to consider and enjoy love in everything. And this is the knowledge of which we are most ignorant. For some of us believe that God is almighty and has power to do everything, and that God has wisdom and knows how to do everything, but that God is all love and is willing to do everything, there we stop. I have tried to think past the stop 
that Julian Norwich writes about in this passage. I have always found it almost impossible truly to believe in my bones and my flesh and my brain that God is all love and truly all love for me. Omnipotent, yes, God is omni, all, potent, powerful. Omniscient, yes, God is omni, all, shent, wise. I know these two attributes make God, God. I was taught this in Sunday school when I was a child. Summer after summer, I sang of this in hymns during worship at church camp. In between listening to the 1980s rock group Van Halen on my cassette player, I had memorized the hymn, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. God knows everything and God can do everything. Check and check. I say these affirmations by rote, but omni-loving? I am not alone in this doubt. One of the earliest examples we have of someone reading Julian of Norwich is in the record of a nun named Margaret Gascione from 17th century France. That was a long time ago, but Sister Margaret is not so far away. Margaret was writing about her struggles to believe that Jesus was actually for her. She was trying to believe in Jesus in a way that was more than just a required affirmation to which she said yes in order to be allowed into heaven. Margaret focused on a passage by Julian to help center herself. The passage Sister Margaret focused on is translated from Middle English in this way. And this is God speaking. Consider me alone, my precious child. Make me your object. I am enough for you. As Nicholas Watson and Jacqueline Jenkins put it, Julian's vision, quote, speaks words of comfort across two and a half centuries to a dying woman still beset by the uncertainties of a theologically gloomier age. End quote. Gloomy is a more polite word than I would use, but the word gloomy begins to tell the truth of a doubt that I have had and that others have also had for centuries. If God is all-knowing and all-powerful, if both of these statements are true, then God may also be omnicruel. Or if God loves, then God's love is twisted. God is the creepiest, most calculating, most omnipatient, sort of horribly cold lover. Is God the sort of supposedly loving lover who waits until the very end of all time to reassure people whom he supposedly loves that love is truly love? Julian of Norwich sees that God is all love and is willing to do everything for us, for me, for you. And that is, truly is, and is, not a will be or a was. Her vision is love and love now. Her vision is not about a love pie in the sky. This vision is not insipid, but it is also so complicated that it took Julian many years to describe what she had seen. This book is my cerebral and soul-racked reckoning with the possibility that Julian of Norwich saw the truth about God. In four parts, I sift through things I have learned and the questions I still have. Time, what it means that Julian says God is willing to do everything, present tense. Truth, what it means that Christians know a truth that makes us odd. Blood, what difference it makes for us that Jesus was bloody and comes in the blood of Holy Communion. Bodies, how you and I are the blood and bone miracle held by God. 
I cannot tell my story of reading her without a short history lesson. This part matters for how Julian thinks about our matter. At the beginning of her short text, she writes, I asked for three graces of God's gift. The first was vivid perception of Christ's passion. The second was bodily sickness. And the third was for God to give me three wounds. I thought of the first as I was meditating. It seemed to me that I could feel the passion of Christ strongly, but yet I longed by God's grace to feel it more intensely, end quote. By praying to come right up next to Jesus and feel the passion of Christ strongly, Julian may have created and received her own opiate, dulling the pain around her with bloody hallucinations. Some readers over the years have decided that is exactly what she did. A woman, a visionary, a universalist, a writer from a long time ago, Julian of Norwich is by many different categories easy to dismiss. I gave a lecture about Julian at a local church and a stately priest, already extra stately in his clerical robe, stood at the back of the lecture hall and asked me about Julian's mental illness. He did this in front of members of his congregation who were there to hear me teach. He explained in front of the members of his congregation that he had been taught in seminary that Julian was put into solitary confinement after having a mental breakdown. I have not heard or read an actual scholar of medieval history called Julian hysterical, but she has been given that loaded label over the centuries by men and women who have not known how to think through what she saw. Taken apart in little quotations, she can seem trite. Her history, taken apart for a case study, may make her appear really strange. Her theological affirmations were so dangerous, it is by some reckonings, not sure I still believe this, I think I may have overstated this, but I, okay, I'll just read the sentence. Her theological affirmations were so dangerous that it is a miracle she was not executed. I think that was overstated, but it's in print now that I said it, but I think it's over, I think I overstated things there. In order to catch sight of the truthful courage and beauty of her visions, it is important to know about the theology of her time and about the meaning of her eventual position as an anchorite. The name that Julian's mother gave her is not available. Julian was not part of the people in England, in the England of her time, to be recorded for posterity. She was not of the aristocracy. That's my reckoning. We cannot look up the name she went by before she came to be called Julian of Norwich. We refer to her by that name because she eventually became an anchorite named after her church. Anchorites were a diverse group, but they had one thing in common. They were anchored to a particular church. At some point, they each dedicated their full-time existence to living in a small apartment attached to a church. We know from official records, every time I read, every time I read my own writing on this, I can find places where I know historians of this period would say, that's, that's too facile, that is, it's more complicated, um, and I know it's more complicated. Uh, it's, I, I will tell people listening um, that one of the real challenges in having this book come to be an actual object in the world was dealing with people who really wanted me to write this book in even simpler and more sensationalist terms than it can come across to people who know the history of this period in England really well. The most important thing perhaps for me to say is that, is that um, People who, who want to read a book about Julian will often want for the author to fill in details that we don't know about that it, or to even make up things and pretend that we know that they are true. At some point, I will 
do a video just about the detail, the historiographic detail um, of how Julian came to be seen as someone who definitely had a cat. Um, there is there is no evidence that she had a cat. Um, yeah, and it's a really funny story, historiographically. It's a funny story about how people tell stories about people who lived in history. So I'll try to stop flinching every time I read a sentence where I know that I have oversimplified or have potentially made things seem more certain than we actually know from historical record. Okay, here we go. We know from, this we do know, we know from official records that by 1393, Julian had become an anchorite in the busy city of Norwich at the busy church of St. Julian's, a name it received centuries before her birth. Sometime in the late 14th century, this writer we now know as Julian took the name of that church. We also know from historical records that she was sought out as a sage. So while some anchorites were secluded, it is likely Julian was at least periodically busy. To think of her as being in solitary confinement is absurd. Catherine M. Valente, a current, a contemporary of ours, a fantasy and science fiction writer who loves Julian and writes a blog about spirituality, describes the life of an anchorite this way, and I love this quote. She is an oracle, an academic, a hermit in the midst of life, end quote. As an anchorite in a busy church, in a busy city, Julian would have been very much in the midst of life. People might have come to hear her words after seeing a beheading or after having buried a husband or after having been accused of heresy. St. Julian's church was not named for Julian of Norwich. She was named for the church. But Julian's church in Norwich may still be around because of her. The woman we now know, I just went too far in the text. Give me one second. The woman we now know as Julian of Norwich loved that church and she became a part of it. St. Julian's church was bombed almost to the ground by orders of a German general during World War II. And the church was rebuilt because many people read and loved Julian of Norwich. Tourists who know nothing about the second century St. Julian, a man for whom the church was originally named, go to Norwich because they believe Julian of Norwich was holy. Pilgrims hope to see the church to which she was attached. Some take Holy Communion there. Maybe they hope to feel close also to her laughter. Julian was a visionary. Around the time that her words were circulating, people were also threatened, imprisoned, and tortured as examples of how not to see the world. King Henry IV and his parliament passed a statute in 1401 called De Heretico Comburendo. It doesn't trip off my tongue. The statute ordered any person adhering to heretical views to be publicly, this is a, a, a translation from the, from the Latin, publicly burnt in a high place. The document added, may punishment of this sort strike fear into the minds of others. Today, a pub in Norwich bears the name Lollard's Pit, and its sign hanging out front features naked people in flames. Hardy har har. <laughs> the notion that an English leader would be so intertwined with a form of faith as to decree death for anyone who thought off-brand is now peculiar enough to be a pub's advertising gimmick. At the turn of the 14th to the 15th century, when Julian was writing, the king and the Archbishop of Canterbury were all up in one another's business. When they were not fighting against one another, they were reinforcing their own power and every intertwined form of control they had available, which was significant. The century during which Julian received her visions and wrote her words culminated in a royal decree to regulate who was allowed to write and speak 
about God. The turn of the 14th to the 15th century was a time of holy mischief. People who were literally hungry due to wheat shortages and feudal machinations were also hungry to read scripture in their own language, to hold a scrap of scriptural verse in their hands. It was a time riddled with despair and sadistic repression. Julian wrote with temerity at this intersection. It is one of the reasons people return to her words and to the church now known for her name. It is a reason I turn to her in order to look the ugly truth in the eye and not only refuse to flinch, but to consider and enjoy love in everything. Julian's Norwich was not so different from any post-disaster, post-apocalyptic world in Western history. She was about, we think, eight years old when a horrific plague known at the time as the Great Plague spread from Europe and the Middle East to England, killing half of the people in many towns and creating a sense of impending disaster that reverberated for generations through recurrence in England of the deadly disease itself and in graphic memories of loved ones lost. She was seeing visions of Jesus's blood coming to her and for her with no intermediary during the same decade when customarily only priests received the cup of blessing, the blood, and the bread or body was parceled out according to a strict division of who was superior to whom. With peasant uprisings throughout England, the rules that governed a system of feudalism were being challenged and also violently reinforced. Under English feudalism, rules about who could speak to whom were kept in part by memorizing who was whose child, by class-based rules about clothing, and by which language people spoke. If you spoke Latin, you were trained in theology and could talk about God. If you spoke French, you were part of the aristocracy. And if you spoke English, you were someone who mostly did not matter to the first two groups unless you tried to change things. Then you were punished. Frederick Christian Bauerschmidt in his 1999 book quotes the historian R.H. Tawney on this point. The gross facts of the social order are accepted in all their harshness and brutality. They are accepted with astonishing docility and except on rare occasions, there is no question of reconstruction. Bowerschmidt explains in his own words, this harshness and brutality is accepted as intrinsic to the social order. Um, and this is also a very complicated story in history um, there were people who were resisting, but in terms of people who had um, worldly power at this time, um, I believe that's what uh, Fritz Bauerschmidt is referring to. The harshness and brutality is accepted as intrinsic to the social order. Julian's long text, which again is not that long, you really can read her. Do I have a copy? I keep doing this where I think I have a copy. I think it's at my office, which under quarantine, I, I haven't been back up to my office um, or under during the pandemic, under isolation. I have not gone back to my office. But if you look up the Penguin edition, it is not long. You can you can read her long text, um, it, possibly in a couple of long sittings. It's it's not it's not. I'm not asking people. I'm not recommending people um, have to read a multi volume set. The long text is, is short, <laughs> but it's the long text because it's referred to as the long text because it's not the short text because she wrote two texts, two versions, which I've already explained, but in case you were curious. Julian's long text was written at a time of societal and personal crisis. Common sense included also a dose of death. The dread of death may have been just a whiff if you were among the few people who lived above the fray, but it was palpable if you were a starving peasant or a commoner who wanted to talk about scripture or changes to the feudal system, or if your village had a recurrence of the plague 
Part of what I have found, part of, <clears throat> part of what I found fascinating, even the first time I read Julian, is how, as Bauer Schmidt puts it, hers is, quote, a particularly crucial period of transition. The docility that Tawny describes in his writings on medieval England is accurate, but there was also resistance. I have come to read Julian right at the juncture of dread, docility, rebellion, and hope. In the mix of all of this, Julian received visions of love, love, and more love. These visions left her asking complex questions for, as she tells us, 15 years and more about the meaning of what she had seen. The answer she received after praying on her visions is clear. The answer she received from God verges on bossy. She writes, my spiritual understanding received an answer, which was this. Do you want to know what the Lord meant? Know well that love was what he meant. This is quoting from her text. I'm going to start over. I just love this so much. Do you want to know what the Lord meant? Know well <laughs> that love was what he meant. Who showed you this? Love. What did he show? Love. Why did he show it to you? For love. Hold fast to this and you will know and understand more of the same, but you will never understand or know from it anything else for all eternity. That's in the 86th um, section of her long text. She continues, I saw quite certainly in this and in everything that God loved us before he made us, and his love has never diminished and never shall. The last few pages of Julian's book about her visions leave us knowing love, 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 and love. And by the way, focusing on these visions of love will, with grace, lead us back into an answer of love. If you want from her visions a different answer to a different question than the one she is asking, and if you crave a different answer than the one she received, she warns you that you can go ahead and look for all eternity at her writings and not find what you were looking for. I'm going to reread that because it's a really important sentence. If you want from her visions a different answer to a different question than the one that she is asking, and if you crave a different answer than the one that she received, she warns you that you can go ahead and look for all eternity at her writings and not find what you were looking for. Bauerschmidt writes that for Julian, quote, from creation to consummation in heavenly bliss, God sees all of humanity as enfolded within the humanity of Christ. Focusing on the cross, Julian returns again and again to see in Jesus Christ God's vision of love. And here in the beautiful, beautiful text that the designers of this gorgeous, visually gorgeous book, and they uh, put in a button. There's a button just wanted you to get to see that. So yeah, here's, here's where I am in the text. Okay. So there's a pause that is a button. John Piper is a popular Christian writer and speaker in the United States. He gave a short lecture in 2009 to the annual meeting of the Religious News Writers Association about a movement and marketing scheme he calls the New Calvinists. In his summary of the basic message of new Calvinism, the most important contribution is its emphasis on human insignificance. That's his word. Using examples from a syndicated cartoon and a granola advertisement, Piper suggested to the gathered reporters that there is a deep longing among all people in the United States for an authoritative word about God's power, particularly after September 11, 2001, he says. As Piper describes it, people desire the truth that God is omnipotent and that, in contrast, humans and our bodies and daily concerns are like dust. When faced with an unimaginable tragedy like September 11, what people, according to John Piper, most want is an affirmation that God controls everything 
and mere human beings control nothing. As I write this book, the new Calvinists often still proclaim this, what I call a gospel of austerity, to generations of Christians and seekers who are trying to live with the aftermath of two wars during an economic debacle, it's putting it nicely, hearing about drone strikes in Pakistan, dealing with the militarization of police in cities across the country, and learning about torture in prisons from Chicago to Cuba. It is fair to characterize the neo-Calvinist message Piper summarized this way. If you are still alive in this age of terror, thank God and stop whining about government surveillance. If you still have any job of any kind during this, the second great depression, pick up your broom and stop complaining about minimum wage. Oh, and keep going to church every Sunday because, because God deserves your obeisance. Julian of Norwich was a woman living through the tumultuous Middle Ages in England, and she saw things differently. She asked a different sort of question, and she embodied a different answer. She assumed that God is all-powerful. She also assumed God's knowledge of all that is. She didn't have to underscore God's knowledge by making sure everyone knows human beings are senseless. Her primary question was about God's love. The query that kept her going back again and again and again to the cross concerned neither God's omnipotence nor God's omniscience. Her query concerned God's omniamity. And that's a word that I made up. In her decades of writing and rewriting her one book, Julian returns to Jesus Christ on the cross like a dancer uses a focal point. When twirling in a circle, a dancer fixes on a point to steady his balance and to avoid keeling over. Julian did the same with the image of Jesus on the cross. She uses a metaphor of a toddler who, when faced with danger, runs to her mother's bosom. Christians seek the Lord's breast in this way, as she puts it. Using maternal language for God does not mean that Julian softens the real monsters of her world. Plagues, public hangings, forms of domination, subtle and overt in a drastically hierarchical country infused with Christianity. These were not figments of a fearful toddler's nightmares. These cruelties were the bloody truth. But Jesus is also the truth for Julian. Seeing the world truthfully through Jesus is her task. Jesus is the reason Julian is able to see the micro fissures and gaping ramifications of evil and go past the stop of doubt in God's omni-amity. God is all love and is willing to do everything, to quote her. That is our focal point, our mother's bosom, our question and our answer. You may have had or may eventually have your own particular snowflake of arsenic difficulties and social torments that lead you to doubt or scorn God's omniamity. Divorce, death, war, domestic violence, cancer, bullying at work or at school, imprisonment, personal horror, is unique, poisonous in a way that is singular and almost indescribable to another human being. I do not presume to interpret Julian authoritatively for everyone. I write alongside Julian in a personal, sometimes pastoral, and unapologetically political way. I assume that all research is in some way introspective, even if the scholar is not acknowledging it. I also assume that my own body is related to the politics of what we might call the social body, the rules of how I'm supposed to think about God and God's relation to me are related to the rules of how I dress, what words I can and cannot say, how I am supposed to raise my daughters and so forth. Any close, careful reading I give of a treasured book 
is also formed by my reading of myself and the politics around me. I should say a word upfront about the most contested P word, political. The first book I read about Julian back when I was preparing my class lectures on revelations of divine love was Frederick Bauerschmidt's 1999 volume. It was in 1999 that I was, I was preparing my first lectures on Julian. Without the telescope of his historical interpretation, she would have remained at the periphery of my spiritual universe. The name of his book is Julian of Norwich and the Mystical Body Politic of Christ. And the ways that England was politically fraught during Julian's time is a central part of Bauerschmidt's analysis. I was persuaded quickly, reading Julian herself, that she was not vapid, but I might have missed the political import of her piety if I had not also read Bauerschmidt's book on the body politic of Christ. He described for me in detail the context for Julian's visions of safety in the cross. Having taught Julian now for 15 years, I have decided that to read her without attention to her politics risks turning her revelations into a logic puzzle. An apolitical reading may become a bloodless interpretation of a book that is often about blood. A comparison to another female writer might help. Nadine Gordimer was a novelist writing during apartheid in South Africa and she was criticized, threatened, and censored for being too political in her stories. Gordimer countered that under a regime that defined every waking moment by procedures of racial and ethnic exclusion and division, human interaction was ineluctably political. In her own time, Julian saw copious blood flowing from the cross that kinned people who were by law supposed to remain unkinned. That is, she saw people made into equals and relatives who were not supposed to be kin with one another. At the turn of the 14th to the 15th century, England was divided into social stations even more rigidly than England currently is. The term blue blood was not a joke. As during other times and in other places, the sense that some people had superior blood and others had inferior blood was based in what I might call somewhat ironically common sense. And the things that went on under the label Jesus Christ or church were part of that hierarchical ordering. Bauerschmidt <laughs> describes the historical record from this period in a way that takes time to understand, but it is worth that time. So this is a long quote from Bauerschmidt. The celebration of the mass, particularly the high mass, in which the priest was assisted by a deacon, subdeacon, and clerks, was a complex rite, R-I-T-E, that depended on the participants properly performing their distinct functions. Bauerschmidt continues, this hierarchical nature of the rite was vividly expressed in the way that subdeacon, deacon, and the priests were ranged on increasingly higher steps before the altar, as well as the complex order of precedence in which the choir was sensed and the gospel book kissed." End quote. The way Holy Communion was arranged reinforced the order of people in England at that time. Holy Communion was like a pageant of the different ranks of people, and it was not the case that the first went last and the last went first. The first layer of people even argued I, the story. And I mean, it's brutal and it still just makes me laugh. Uh, it reminds me of Monty Python here, it, but it's evidently part of the historical record. <laughs> at the time that Julian laughed at the devil, there also was a practice called the ceremonial kissing of the pax bread. Bauerschmidt relates a story of a man intent on being higher in the ordering of the first sorts of people who used the pax bread or peace bread to hit the person carrying the pax bread, angry that someone else had established prominence by kissing the bread before he did. Like, if you thought that it's only today that Christians are um, can be um, say that they're Christian and still be power hungry, very scary, really bad people. Um, yeah, it's 
it's been happening for a long time. <laughs> These practices were all tangled up with ways that the English aristocracy and the Roman Catholic Church were attempting to keep the lid on changes to the system of Christianity. And by the way, this is, so this is before the beginnings of the Anglican Church, and I'm not trying to single out the Roman Catholic Church as being particularly hierarchical, but they were at the time, and they were the church in this area at this time. A whole other lecture on that. People in the upper ranks of England during Julian's time argued and threatened one another over who could be at the front of the line to kiss Jesus. Let that historical fact sink in. I cannot now unsee what Bauerschmidt helped me to see. I cannot take the politics back out of Julian's visions. Given what I now know, so my book on Julian is also political. And it's not just people who disagree with my politics who don't like that. There are people who want to read her in a way that um, they don't want politics to, to sully to sully her visions. Um, this is, I'm going off script, but uh, I know that from experience at this point. People, not everyone who has an icon of Julian in their office wants to think about politics when they are reading Julian. <sighs> so my book on Julian is also political. Her visions of Jesus's blood coming to her and of Jesus's blood making each one of us family are politically loaded. There is another escape route away from reading Julian politically. In his book on this period in England's history, Richard Wool and the in Invention of Authority, that's the name of Nicholas Watson's book, published in 1991, Watson helpfully explains how thinkers thinking alongside Julian can render her hygienically apolitical. That's my term, not his, but can render her hygienically apolitical by tossing her into the stratosphere and leaving her there. People may be tempted to hagiography or making a person into a holy icon. Oh gosh, how do I explain that? Look up hagiography, that'll be helpful. H-A-G-I-O-G-R-A-P-H-Y. People may be tempted to hagiography when reading a writer who has seen visions from God. Quote, approaching the verbal surface of a text with a mixture of aesthetic and religious awe. Those were Watson's words. Hagi, oh, here I go. I explained it. I should have just trusted my own words. Hagiography technically means writings about a saint. Writing hagiography today in my world means turning a merely human writer into an angel. I am using the term to describe the way some writers make another writer into someone who is not writing for flawed people like me. Julian might become worthy of my awe and my study, but with this sort of hagio hagiographic, there we go, hagiographic misreading, I myself become unworthy of reading her as writing for me. It does not help that someone at Penguin Books, and I'm very grateful for the translation, but someone at Penguin Books decided to put on the cover of their edition, which contains the best translation that I can recommend easily that's accessible and not terribly expensive. They put on the cover a young woman who is not Julian of Norwich. The portrait of a young woman wearing a coif, the painting by Roger van der Vaden's. Um, he, so try that again. Okay. Roger van der Vaden's portrait of a young woman wearing a coif, which is the name of the painting that's on the cover, presents a person in a starched, clean, white coif, looking like she might possibly sometimes smile, but would never laugh at the devil and probably would not risk the indecorum of laughing like Nicki Minaj. Although women who are not in a religious order wore coifs during Julian's time, the connotation for readers today is of a prim nun, and I have many friends who are women religious, but you get the idea here. The way the book's cover is situated, the words Penguin Classics and Julian of Norwich, Revelations of Divine Love, also cover the woman's ample breasts and folded, ungloved hands. It's, it's really funny. I mean, if you look at the cover, it's, it's, it, it covers over, you can't see, you can't see from here. And um, it's just it, in the actual painting, the, the, the woman, the portrait of a young woman um, that Roger van der Vaden uh, painted, 
it, it, she's an ample bosom and she's, she has ungloved hands. And uh, yeah, they, they, so the cover doesn't even show the full painting of someone who wasn't Julian of Norwich. You have to turn the book over for the full view of the chosen painting. Watson's funniest example of the silly, blessed Mother Julian reading that leaves her floating angelically above worldly politics is this. This is a great quote from Watson. What Mother Julian meant we cannot know in this life. End quote. Hogwash, Watson says. Watson does not actually use the word hogwash, but it fits. He recommends a way of avoiding such silliness when reading Julian. Quote, focus instead on what we can call a mystical writer's predicament in formulating doctrinal positions, articulating an appropriately didactic discourse, and describing mystical experience. Continuing the quote, look at the specifically mundane pressures that beset a mystical text, impelling it toward complex and ambiguous claims for its own status. And I know this is very dense prose, but if you if you look at the quote, um, and hopefully you can, if you can get even access to a sample of the book online, you can look, this is on page 12 of the introduction. And I think this quote, if you read it closely, you'll be able to understand it better than my reading it quickly to you now. Uh, so, in other words, think about this mystical text with the actual earth in mind. Given that Watson is a medievalist and he has gone to the trouble of italicizing the word mundane in this book, I looked up the uses of mundane during Julian's time. Then, as now, it means earthly, earthy, of this real planet we walk around on and sleep on and eat from. Watson is explaining to his own readers that it makes sense to read a writer like Julian as a person who was writing from a particular real life that involved pressures that are right here on this ground, held by the same gravity that holds us today. Your predicaments will be unique, but to read Julian as a non-earth creature is to avoid not only her earthly challenges, but potentially your own. Her claims to truth are complex and ambiguous, Watson notes, but that may make her writing all the more fascinating as an embodiment of truth. I am not interested in teaching a Christian writer who is caught sure a mundane theologian who was confused periodically and who needed time to sort and sift and think and pray in order to write down what she learned from God is worth my trouble. Van der Raden's portrait of a young woman wearing a coif does suit Julian in one respect. Her eyes hint that she has much more to say than you would at first glance guess. Her eyes look a bit like Mona Lisa's eyes. Teaching Julian has been different from teaching someone in the Christian tradition with a capital T, who bears the authoritative stamp of gravitas with a capital G. Julian is a woman who wrote like a woman, and she wrote about blood. The challenge of convincing young conservative Christian students who have been told to trust only theologians with penises to pick up her book and read it has been a surprising gift. It's true. I've had to learn how to be a really good teacher. It is precisely the mundane particulars and her predicament that hooks them to read her visions as more than a task to check off their list. Reading her politically has helped students not to underestimate the more that is hinted at by the painting on the cover of the book. Julian's vision of God's omni-amity and the plentiful shedding of his precious blood, that's her words, is a different perspective on the world than that of the various John Pipers of her own time. Men determined to shore up God's sovereignty and accentuate human impotence. The mundane aspects of Norwich life 600 years ago help me to see and to teach Julian's visions of God's homely friendship with crimson vitality. Here is one 
basic mundane intersection of Julian's visions and what goes on in church worship service today. Not during the pandemic right now, but usually. And um, that was an aside because I'm, I'm speaking these words on October 6, 2020. Christians are supposed to believe that the people gathered in worship are Jesus's body on earth and that the bread of the altar, bread on the altar, is Jesus's body for our bodies. So how the food line at church is structures, structured matters for how people see one another. Julian prayed to receive Jesus and saw each person as part of the same body of Christ. She saw a Jesus who did not parcel out himself according to the strict hierarchy of England, but who was grace itself in bodily form and also in his body. Jesus is profligate grace, giving life and making each human life real and good and family with all others. That blurring of lines between groups of people was a capital offense by the 15th century. Julian of Nor Norwich could have been hanged for describing the holy miscegenation she had received in her visions. This may explain her frequent use of maybe and like and perhaps and other words that have marked Julian as feminine over the centuries. I've had students dismiss Julian outright because Revelations of Divine Love does not read like a debate or as an academic duel. She saw people who supposedly had different kinds of blood all mixed together in Jesus's blood and knit together in Jesus's body. It took Julian repeated careful engagement with what she knew was the official doctrine of Holy Church and what she knew she had seen from God to land finally on the strong possibility of universalism in the final version of her long text. Her use of what may be seen as tentative language could, not necessarily, but could be in part her deference to church authorities. But this language also represents her persistence to find the best words to express the challenging truths she had received in her initial visions. I'm guessing that is the postal, the man who is the postal carrier for the U.S. Postal Service coming to bring my mail. And my dogs are going to bark for a while and I'm going to read through it. The Lollards, after whom the trendy Norwich pub I mentioned is named, has become a catch-all term for heretics sufficiently troublesome to be censored or killed. The term was used most frequently for followers of John Wycliffe who argued for the translation of scripture into the language most people actually used to communicate, English. Many of the people labeled lollards thought Christians ought to be able to hear the words used by another person in worship in their own language and to hear scripture read by another person in words they could understand. Again, at this time in England, the royalty spoke and wrote in French and holy people in charge wrote and spoke in Latin. The language of Christianity at Julian's time was regimented to keep the social body, that is, the people who made up the daily life of reality, divided into layers. There were those allowed to read the holy words, handle the holy objects, and be buried in the holiest places, and those who were not. And again, there were gradations among the various layers. To be anachronistic, to make a point, the lords and ladies went before the ladies and gentlemen, went before the doctors and lawyers, went before the hotel heiresses and heirs, went before the extended family of a once celebrated athlete, went before the common people who ride the bus because they can't afford gas, and so on. Can you imagine if you walked into a church that required people to line up for the Lord's Supper that way? Can you imagine being told you could not talk about theology until you learned Latin? If anyone tells you that, well, I won't say more, but just, huh. Or that you had no right to learn French because your blood was not the right sort of blood. The historic fact of the plague is also important for understanding Julian's visions. Grace Jansen, in her 1988 book, has a summary of the human misery and church crisis. I'm going to read this through quickly because otherwise I'll get verklempt. 
um, because we're living through the pandemic of 2020. So Grace Jansen has a summary of the human misery and church crisis brought on by the great plague that I cannot summarize better than I can quote. And here, I'm, this is a long quote from Grace Jansen's book. People died horribly and suddenly and in great numbers. It was so contagious that one contemporary witness describes how anyone who touched the sick or the dead caught the disease and died himself. So that priests who ministered to the dying were flung into the same grave with their penitents. It was impossible for the clergy to keep up with all those who required last rites and to die unshriven was seen as a catastrophe of eternal proportions. Nor could the people who died be buried with dignity. The psychological impact on the survivors was incalculable, made worse in subsequent years by the further outbreaks which occurred at unpredictable intervals. I mean, it, this is an end of her quote, but um, I just want to note that at, the, at this time um, that Jansen is describing, they didn't know they'd lived through the Great Plague. For all they knew, a, a greater one was coming. Jansen explains that more than a third of the people of Norwich died during this relatively short period of time, and around half of the priests did. One word in the quote that was new to me when I first read her words, uh, Jansen's words, years ago is unshriven. I didn't know that word when I read it. Priests who did not flee the deadly plague were dying, and so their parishioners were dying without being given the last rites. The prayers and actions performed by a priest to give those at the end of a life a chance to confess and receive communion or the mass before they died. Jansen points out that people were not only losing their loved ones left and right, they understood that they were losing their loved ones in a way that would separate them forever from one another. People were dying without receiving the practice that secured one's hope for eternal life with God and with one another. So, during a time when food shortages periodically swept through England and there was not enough bread for people to eat, there was a spiritual crisis as well. People not only died of the plague, but they died in a way that left survivors in despair. Julian grew up in the wake of this tragedy. And here there's another little note. This is page 16. So I wanna show you what the artists who created this beautiful book have done. Um, there's an ant. The artist's name who um, created the drawings for the book is Julian Alexander. Julian, J-U-L-I-E-N-N-E. -N -N -E. Piper, going back to John Piper, argued that the mass murder of September 11th brought on a crisis of biblical, biblical proportions, eliciting in people a desire to be reminded of their own submission and insignificance before the Lord God Almighty and his inscrutable purposes. There is an unhelpful way to point to 9-11 as the cause of every ensuing cultural impulse in the United States. And I understand it is possible to overestimate the import of 9-11, but I have found reading Julian of Norwich helpful for thinking about different responses to what might be called collective trauma or trauma suffered at a societal level by a large group of people. I have come to believe that it is not merely coincidence that there has been an outbreak of medieval philia, medieval philia, I think that's the way to put it, in the United States since 9-11. I interpret the popularity of movies like the Lord of the Rings trilogy and the television show Game of Thrones as a misdirected desire on the part of some viewers to watch staged hangings, beheadings, impalings, sexual violation, and large-scale destruction to experience a manageable form of affliction. The rise in violence on screen, large and small screen, after 9-11 may be similar to the impulse of a survivor of sexual violence to cut herself in order to try to become the master of the pain she has endured. During a time of misery and division, Julian asked to receive a bodily experience of Jesus' suffering. By one reading, this was nuts. I think her request for proximity to pain 
was a way of responding to the manifold traumas going on in her time. I think she asked for the wounds of Jesus to take her away from a cycle of despair, shame, domination, and the violence of retribution that tempts at least some people during times of political tumult. Julian's answer of God's omniamity is a redirection away from, from an obsessive rotation of fear, shame, domination, and submission. Her visions of God's love scramble the hierarchical ordering of things, or to put it differently, all bloodlines are bled together. And her visions answer that God has not favored the survivors over the afflicted. Her answer to the crisis of her time was not to reinforce the order of things, affirm the rightness of authority, and threaten other people subtly or overtly with God's wrath or God's indifference. On 9-11-01, children across the United States watched their parents and their teachers watching their televisions with horror as people died in ways that are unthinkable. One response to seeing human beings reduced to worse than nothingness is to submit to and inhabit that version of religious truth. We are dust. Deal with it. Another response, Julian's response, is eventually, after years of trying to understand what she had received from God, to, to discern a vision of redemption. And this is a quote from her long text, um, section 32, 32nd section. At one time, our good Lord said, all manner of things shall be well. And at another time, he said, you shall see for yourself that all manner of things shall be well. And the soul understood these two sayings differently. On the one hand, he wants us to know that he does not only concern himself with great and noble things, but also with small, humble, and simple things, with both one and the other. And this is what God means when God says, all manner of things shall be well. For he wants us to know that the smallest things shall not, dang it, be forgotten. Ah, I knew I was going to get for Clement at some point. Just happened. For he wants us to know that the smallest things shall not be forgotten. End quote. Hence the cover of the book with all the tiny things that will not be forgotten. Whew, sorry. Ah. By the proper analytically true reckoning of her time, a significant percentage of the population were eternally lost. By the proper political reckoning of her time, the great and noble were the arbiters to restore proper order and win again God's favor. I am willing to wager that the proper common sense reckoning of many Christians during Julian's time was that it would be foolhardy to recommit to hope in the smallest things at such an apocalyptically terrifying time. But Julian received visions that emboldened the words of lived lives, making them stand out not just as not forgotten, but brought bit by bit into God's goodness. She received visions that underscored the holy significance of actual, daily, real people and our actual, daily hopes and fears. The holy significance, not the insignificance. As the poet Denise Levertov writes of Julian, quote, She lived in dark times, as we do. War and the Black Death, hunger, strife, torture, massacre, end quote. Julian's visions are not timeless. They are timely. So next chapter, the first official chapter, I will start with Julian's perspective on time. Thank you for listening.